Liquid Dive Trans Am Tour has been as competitive as any series in the world in 1991. Canadian Ron Bellow sits on top of the points chase, but has yet to win a race. Young Scott Sharp has been successful in his first season driving for Chevrolet, and he's won two of the four Trans Am contests this year and is currently second in points. Longtime Trans Am veteran Greg Pickett has made a return to the series where he made his racing name and is only four points behind Bellows. The Trans Am battle continues on the road course at Portland International Raceway. ESPN, the world leader in motorsports coverage, presents Speed World. It is a cool and overcast day in the Pacific Northwest as we welcome you to Portland International Raceway, the scene of Trans Am competition for more than 15 years now, a popular spot. Hello, I'm Gary Gerald, and it's with a good deal of anticipation that we welcome you to round number five of the SCCA Liquid Tide Trans Am Tour. It's a tour that's been loaded with great racing already this year. In four preceding events, we've had three different winners, and it's resulted in a terrific points battle. Canadian Ron Fellows currently narrowly at the top of the heap, but Scott Sharp and Greg Pickett and numerous others are right there challenging as we go to this round here at Portland. Joining me in the booth today, our expert analyst, Derek Daly, knows this racetrack well, has competed here in IndyCars. And Derek, thanks largely to an interesting and intriguing set of SCCA rules, we have V6 versus V8, and it's a decision that every driver has to make before every race. Which power plant will he use? That's right. I spoke to team owner Buzz McCall this morning, and he really thinks the SCCA have done a great job writing their regulations here, particularly pertaining to the engines. When they came here, they said Portal needs a V8, loads of horsepower, but the cars are a bit heavy. Yet there's a V6 on the pole. Last week at Detroit, you need a light car, very nimble handling, that a V6 should dominate. A V8 was on the pole. So the question as to which engine is the best really remains to be answered. But Team Rocket Sports, who dominate the front row here, they're covered in the event of whatever racetrack they go. They have 24 engines, of which is a mixture between V6 and V8, so they're covered for whatever circumstance they need. Irv Hare and Paul Gentilosi teammates on the front row and the third man on our broadcast team Jan Bikas now with Irv Hare thanks Gary last weekend in Detroit the front row was all Chevrolet here in Portland it's all Oldsmobile with the two Olivetti cars occupying the front row Irv Hare is on the pole and Irv you blistered the track record in qualifying do you think he can pull off your second win of the season here well you know it's it's never easy here at Portland we definitely have to uh take our time and take care of our car in the first half of the race but if we you know if we can take care of it in the first half and have a healthy car in the second half we'll bring the Oldsmobile home first okay we got the gentlemen start your engines here tell me is it going to be a race where you're going to have to watch the tires yeah it's you know we'll, if somebody wants to run fast enough to hurt their car we're just going to have to let them do it and just make sure we take care of our car okay good luck gary so, engines are fired in a 28-car field here. Assembling air on the front straightaway will shortly be in action, rolling out in this, the fifth stop on the Trans Am Tour this year. Paul Gentilosi is alongside of Irv Hare, and as you heard, it is an all Oldsmobile front row. They, Team Rocket Sports, have had a terrific start thus far this year. In fact, in the season opener at Sears Point, their team went one, two, and three. They commanded the top three spots. Gentilosi, just last week in Detroit, had a terrific finish as he was again in the top three, and all of that has contributed to what has been a very exciting early point season on this, the 26th year of Trans Am competition. So final instructions, crew members hovering alongside. The crews very shortly will step away from the cars, and these cars will be rolling for the first of two warm-up laps here at Portland International Raceway. We'll be ready for the FCCA Liquid Tide Trans Am Tour. This presentation of Speed World brought to you by Quaker State. The Big Q is one tough motor oil. By Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by smooth bush beer and easy drinking, Bush Light. We'll be back for the start from Portland. Coming up in just a few moments. It's one of the most technologically advanced, most rigorously tested fluids on Earth. Relentlessly measured for maximum protection against the friction. 
the wear and tear, the heat and stress of today's engines. It is today's Quaker State. In Europe, in Japan, in America, Quaker State quality has passed the most demanding tests automakers can throw at it. At Quaker State, we don't just say we're tough, we're tested tough. The big Q is one tough motor oil. One manufacturer has more NASCAR victories than anyone. More NHRA Pro Stock victories than anyone. More consecutive IMSA GTO victories at Daytona than anyone. And more off-road victories in the last five years than anyone. That manufacturer is Ford. No wonder nobody enjoys the weekend like Ford. There aren't any fax machines or PCs to help you at this job. And your career path is largely determined by the mood of your horse. So why would anyone choose to work up here in the mountains? Maybe it's the fringe benefits. Last year, every single race in the World Sports Car Championship was won on Goodyear Eagle tires. Including eight of the nine championship races won by Mercedes-Benz. The World Championship winning Mercedes-Benz team uses Goodyear Eagle radials exclusively. And their winning performance is just one of the reasons we say the best tires in the world have Goodyear written all over them. Warm-up laps winding down at Portland International Raceway now. The field getting ready to go racing 53 laps, just over 100 miles on a tight 1.9-mile nine-turn road course. Here's your starting lineup. Irv Hare and Paul Genalozzi. We heard from Hare. He starts in the pole with a track record there in the front row. Jack Baldwin in one of the powerful Camaros. Stuart Hayner, a bit of a surprise, who came in and won a race here just a week ago known as the Rose Cup. He knows the track well from the second row. Bill Mayer, Darren Brassfield, two interesting stories that we'll touch on as this race unfolds in row three. Ron Fellows, who leads the point standings, and Greg Pickett, a veteran Trans Am campaigner in row four. Steve Mayer, identical twin brother of Bill Mayer, of course, and Scott Sharp, who has won at Detroit and at Mexico City, rounding out row number five. And down through the field, veteran driver Tommy Gloy, Jim Derhoff, Bob Sobey, George Robinson. We've got outstanding talent all the way back through the field, and there'll be contenders trying to charge and work their way through traffic. Remember, a year ago in this event at Portland, on the start, at the end of the front straightaway, there is a chicane, and we had a massive pileup that involved a couple of strong contenders, and that has to be very much on the mind of every one of these drivers, Derek Daly, as they get set now, anticipating the turn for home and the green flag. That's right, the start is ultra important. It's also very dangerous, but these cars are very heavy. The brakes do not work well on until they're warm, and of course they're not warm until they race, so that's why this chicane is so important on this first lap. And it's a very cool day, and look at this traffic jam on board with Darren Grassfield momentarily as they sweep six wide across the track. Baldwin on the inside challenging. Let's see as they make the move into the chicane, jumping up and challenging right away as they start to string out. We thought it was Sharp, maybe no, it's Baldwin who jumps out on top. Everybody safely getting through, it appears, the first scary moment of this event. And now, in single file procession, it's Stu Hayner who has grabbed the lead. Hayner, who was a surprising winner in cars similar to this a week ago, while the Trans Am Tour was in Detroit, competed in the Rose Cup here, and he won the event. What a jump Stu Hayner got. He came from the second row all the way down the outside. We watched Jack Baldwin try to go down the inside, but Stu Hayner took full advantage. And look at the lead he has already. Hopped and that the lead is going to cost him, Derek. They're talking about a black flag. He jumped the start. The start was too good. And so now he is going to be penalized, which means he's going to have to go to the pits and then come all the way from the back to try to challenge again. My word, what a disaster for the local team here owned locally Stu Hayner you said so successful last week and he is about to see the black flag what a disaster so very shortly Jack Baldwin is going to be at the head of this pack he's followed by Ron Fellows and then the three gentle cars can look at Darren Brassfield he's right up in fifth place already 
Anner goes down now. We assume that he got the black flag. We did not see to know for sure, certain. Certainly his crew will be in radio contact with him. But what a disappointment after that sensational start that saw cars six wide across this racetrack. So Baldwin now becomes your leader in the green and white number 28. Ron Fellows, the points leader from Canada, who has one career Trans Am win, currently racing in second. Look at the Oldsmobile, though, the three black Oldsmobiles. They're all over this Ford and Chevrolet group ahead of them. So the gentle Ozzy cars, the rocket sport cars, really dominate a practice with Jack Baldwin, big Jack. He's going to be a hard man to catch and pass. Look at Ron Fellows. Car dives down under heavy braking. This is the very fast S's, and this here is the slowest corner on the racetrack. They make the swing here around this slow corner and then back onto the front straightaway where we saw that sensational start. He has not yet come in. We still have not seen the 98 car come in yet. We added the indication. We saw the black flag now being displayed. So Stuart Hayner from your Belinda, California in a V8 Camaro who thought he had the lead in this race is about to go to the back of the pack. Probably the next time by, he'll have to dive into the pits. So Jack Baldwin... He is leading, not on the road, but he is the leader. We see his best finish here, fourth place, Mexico and Dallas. This is the Buzz McCall car. Ron Fellows, that's a Jack Roush car, sponsored by McKenzie Financial in second place. Then the three black Oldsmobiles, all in chase, all ready to pounce. We've also been informed from SCCA officials that Stuart Hayner, if he doesn't acknowledge this black flag, each time he completes another lap, it's going to take another $100 out of his potential paycheck here. He is being fined at $100 a tour if he doesn't acknowledge the flag and get in this time. Baldwin still holds on to the second spot. Fellows is right there. And then it's the Rocket Sports Oldsmobiles who run third, fourth, and fifth in close pursuit. And here comes the man who thought he had the lead in to acknowledge the black flag. Stuart Hayner being held by officials now being waved on. And after that terrific start, he'll come back onto the front straightaway. But look at all the cars that have already streamed by as he tries to pick up a spot now. And he's almost virtually at the end of the field. What a terrible thing for a driver. We're now inside Darren Brassfield's car. This is the third of the Black Oldsmobiles in line. That's the team owner, Paul Gentilosi, just ahead of him, and the pole sitter, Irv Hare, and the other sister team car ahead of him. Look at Irv Hare trying to come down the inside of Ron Fellows. What a great position to watch the action from inside Darren Brassfield's car here. Look at uh, Gentilosi puts on the brake. Look at the way these cars slip and slide. Irv Hare goes a bit wider. Look at Gentilosi over the curve. Darren Brassfield watches everything. Remember, Brassfield has won here before, and he's won this year in Sonoma, California, up at Sears Point, the first race of this year. And you get a feeling now of the speed as they come through one of the quicker portions, now down to this tight ninth turn, which Derek indicated is the tightest on the course, and then they'll be back through the gears, trying to run it up to full speed on this long front straightaway, interrupted only about two-thirds of the way down by that little hiccup or chicane. We'll get a good chance to look at it here from the driver's perspective as he flashes by the flag stand the start finish line and now he comes to the chicane swings it first to the right and then quickly back to the left oh look at gentle Ozzy, all over the curves when he turns left and then bounces over those curves on the right uses the racetrack and uses parts he's not supposed to use but i suppose he's the team owner he owns the cars he can do whatever he likes with them how much does that unsettle the car when you get up on the curve like that well of course in a straight line which is more or less what he was when he's under acceleration the car just bounces over it but oh look at the fluid, so fluid coming fluid. from the back of the car from the back of that. We don't know whether that's a water overflow from when the engine gets very hot, but we will have to watch that. But Jet Lozy, if he gets sideways over the curves, he's over the curves there again. It can damage the car. We're back with Ron Fellows chasing Jack Baldwin. Fellows a second. Third place is still Irv Hare. Hare started from the pole position, lost the advantage momentarily, and now Fellows tries to tighten up the pressure as he challenges Baldwin, tries to look for room to get to the inside, can't do it, as they again complete another lap and come down the long front stretch. Chevrolet versus Ford versus Oldsmobile. So three manufacturers well represented here. Baldwin is pretty good in a straight line, but Ron Fellows seems to catch up a little bit under braking. Let's check in on the pit area now with our colleague, John Beekus. 
Patrick McFall is the crew chief for Stu Hayner. Have you been speaking with him on the radio about the black flag penalty? Yeah, he didn't fully understand what it was about. Uh, he waited until the green flag, and they're saying he passed before start finish. So you're saying he does not feel he jumped the start? No, he doesn't feel he jumped it, but uh, now we're just going to try to get back to the front, drive it till the wheels fall off. Well, it should be very exciting if, in fact, he can drive it until the wheels come off. We'll continue to watch progress here. Trans Am competition from Portland. Every week, over a quarter million owners of the biggest names in the automotive business trust their cars to Pennzoil at the exact same place. Jiffy Lube and the world-class protection of Pennzoil, the biggest names in the business. Stop in for our car care travel book. Its coupons will save you lots of money down the road. Over the last 50 years at Wade Ford, we've tried to listen to you, our customer. And in keeping with that tradition, we offer you one low, no-hassle price. You'll find every car and truck on our lot clearly marked with one low, no-hassle price. We think you'll find it your most positive car buying experience ever. The Los Angeles Dodgers are leading the National League West. The bionic arm of Oral Hershiser is back to its old dominating self. The Dodgers face the Braves live at 8 Eastern on ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Once again, after 7 of 53 complete here at Portland International Raceway, Jack Baldwin as our leader, Ron Fellows, Irv Hare, Brassfield, and Gentilozzi occupy the top five spots. It has been Baldwin on the point since a controversial start that uh, cost Stuart Hayner, who thought he had the lead of this race, and a magnificent traffic jam on the front straightaway. Let's go back, Derek Daly, and take a look at this wild scramble for position at the green flag. Now, Stu Hayner is the yellow Camaro, he ducks out. Look at it, he ducks out behind the front row, and they're saying that before the start, he made the pass, and he did. Before he got over the start finish line, there's no question he did make the pass. I'm afraid the black flag was justified. Hayner has now battled his way back up through virtually half the field. He is running in 15th position, but he's got a long, tough battle to try to get back into contention as we watch now. Baldwin on top. Fellows, the season point leader in third, and Hare, who had the track record from the pole at just over 101 miles per hour, running in third spot. Incidentally, on the last lap, averaging better than 99 miles per hour, so there's only about a two-mile-an-hour drop-off from the qualifying times and speeds that we saw posted earlier. Now, in the opening of the show, we mentioned the V8 and the V6 cars. These two leaders, first and second, are V8 cars. They make more horsepower, but they are heavier. When you're heavier, the car uses the tires more. The Oldsmobiles are V6 engines. They make less horsepower, but they're lighter. They say that in the second half of the race, they'll have better handling. They feel they'll be in a stronger position. And that's something certainly we'll be trying to keep an eye on as this race unfolds. But right now, Baldwin, who finished sixth last year, has himself in the lead. He comes in back in points. He's in the top ten, but he's ninth in the overall point standings. And certainly a great finish here would uh, help him in what has been a terrific points battle thus far this season. But I'll tell you what, he is not getting any breathing room. And look at the little wiggle at the rear of the car as he sets it up now and comes through that chicane one more time. Jack Baldwin leads. Ron Fellows, he oh, has a little Fellows. sneaky look down the inside. <laughs> I think Ben Robert gets back inside. But I think one of the men we're going to have to watch is Darren Brassfield. He's carrying our in-car camera. He has crawled up behind Irv Hare. So Darren Brassfield looks to me to be one of the fastest cars on the right side. Look at this. He's all over Irv Hare. Four men running nose to tail literally here at the head of the pack. It has been incident-free other than that black flag situation on the jump start by Hayner, who's now back 
second mid back trying to come forward. Everybody chasing Jack Baldwin. Had a fourth place finish at Mexico City. Also a fourth place finish in the temporary circuit in Dallas as his best finishes this year. A two-time IMSA GTU champion, and he's got his hands full right now, almost being nudged from behind by Ron Fellows. Oh, Ron Fellows, I'm sure he's feeling the heat from the Oldsmobile behind him. If he thinks he's faster than Jack Baldwin, he has to make this move soon. We saw him right, and he's still right up on the bumper of Jack Baldwin. He, oh, he's trying to go around the, out the inside. Oh, oh, yeah. Over the curve. Over the curve, and he makes it. But now, of course, he comes back onto the racetrack, and he does a magnificent job of angling on. He almost lost it totally, was off course twice, but there he is in the lead, and he's very much on the circuit now. Oh, that was the most unique pass of the chicane that we have seen. If any of the IndyCar guys who are also here this weekend see that, that's a novel way to get the lead. In a dangerous way, sometimes you lose control, but what a way to take the lead. They're going to black flag Ron Fellows for that particular move. Second time, and here's a problem for one of the Mayer brothers. Phil Mayer from Yakima, Washington, briefly off course, now gets restarted and pointed in the right direction. Former Olympic ski medalist who is a newcomer to Trans Am competition, but here's another battle, and we've got Baldwin back on top now. Baldwin has gone by Fellows, and remember, Fellows is going to be looking at a black flag as they come by the flag stand this time. And there's the indication. Season points leader is going to have a costly penalty imposed as he'll have to go to the pits just as Stu Ainer did early in the competition that cost him the lead of the race. Well, I'm not sure that I fully agree with that black flag, but let's have a look at the replay. Now, look at this. He tries to go down the inside. Now, he's virtually out of control here, bounces over the curbs. I'm sorry, but there is nothing he can do about the exit of that chicane. He really has to take that avoiding action to keep his car straight. I'm not sure that warrants the same type of black flag as the jump start did earlier on. And black flag or not, what a job he did of hanging, hanging on to that race car and not totally losing control and ending up perhaps in a barrier somewhere off course. Back inside with Darren Brasfield. What entertainment he has had. He saw his team leader climb all over the curbs earlier, get on the grass a couple of times. Now he's watched Ron Fellows and he sits back, watches the action and Ron Fellows is about very soon to head for the pit lane. Well, Derek, we're just advised that the SCCA officials have apparently changed their mind. They've called off the black flag. Oh, he is good. back in second place, so apparently somebody else shared your opinion that's and good. Fellows is spared. A good decision, a good decision because that keeps the race intact and when you try and pass cars and oh, he's over the curve again remember you're on the limit of these cars you can't pick and choose the piece of road you want to use all the time a good decision by the SCCA only a half second separating those top four as they have continued to battle fellows chasing Baldwin now a bit of space a little separation because of the traffic but it has been a dandy thus far here at Portland International Raceway on the SCCA liquid tide Trans Am Tour. Fact. Ford offers performance that's supercharged and turbocharged. Fact. Ford offers 16, even 24 valve engines. Fact. Mustang GT, Pro GT, Thunderbird SC, Escort GT, and Taurus SHO make up the best-selling line of performance cars, American or import. Call it leadership. Call it winning. The simple fact is, Ford is number one. Have you driven a Ford lately? Where do you want to be in 20 years? Well, my father worked for the same company for 39 years. He got two weeks vacation, but we never traveled far. He was saving to put three kids through college. At 65, he retired. At 67, he died. How can I invest so that after my kids graduate, I can enjoy the second half of my life? You can get there from here. With Shearson Lehman Brothers. If you've got the luck of the Irish, dreams can come true. Only one of Europe's premier thoroughbreds will win the pot of gold at the Budweiser Irish Dart. Sunday afternoon on ESPN. Stu Ainer, who had the 
black flag to start this race, went to the back of the pack, has now worked his way into the top ten in our Trans Am coverage from Portland International Raceway. He drives car number 98. It's a V8 Camaro. This is only his second Trans Am race. He's 13 seconds behind the leader, Jack Baldwin, but he's done a remarkable job getting back into contention. And now we see Bill Mayer's car going back into the pits, apparently out of the competition. And what great disappointment for a man who was able to start in the top 10 in his first start of the Trans Am season. Back on board now with Darren Brassfields. He continues to pound away, challenging his teammate, Irv Hare. Hare in third place, and then in front of them, Fellows and Baldwin. Those four have dominated the competition. Now let's check down in the pit area. Jan Bikas is standing by with a very disappointed, I'm sure, Phil Mayer. We're with Phil Mayer. Phil, you're running real well, and this was your debut in Trans Am. What happened? Uh, we lost the clutch in the car. I just it can't get any traction off the corners. It's just spinning, and I think I dropped the cylinder about 10 laps in, so we're done. That's one of the differences between skiing and racing, isn't it? The skis always get you down the hill, but the car won't always get you to the line. <laughs> well, when you're skiing, you know, have nobody to blame but yourself when you make mistakes. And, you know, you can have the drive of your life going out here, and, you know, a five-cent park could let you go. So it's just unfortunate. Well, we ran real well. And we want to thank Xerox Antifree School and Valvoline Oil and Goodyear for helping us out. Now we see Scott Sharp for the first time coming into our picture also. Start a 10th on the grid. Scott Sharp coming off two wins in a row, Mexico City and uh, Detroit. But Scott Sharp, oh, we see him climb all over the curves. They use the curves and the racetrack, whatever it takes. Luckily, these cars are built so strong that you can actually use the curves without doing too much damage. Scott Sharp is one of the youngest drivers in the competition. He's only 23 years of age, and as Derek indicated, he has won two of the four events thus far this year. He's second in the overall point standings coming in, and the man who leads the points is up there just a few spots ahead of Sharp. That's Ron Fellows, car number four, currently in second place. But what's happening, Derek? It appears that Sharp is definitely closing some ground. He's getting himself into contention where at the midpoint of the second half of this race, he may have the tires. He may have the muscle to make this a five-car battle. And what a great thing to get the adrenaline going when you can see the lead pack and you get closer and in closer with every lap which is what Scott Sharp is doing it's a great thing to fire you up and get you emotionally charged because now look at now it's a five car train because Scott Sharp is within a car length of being right behind Darren Brasfield and there's a bit of traffic also just ahead of the leaders and this could get very interesting very quickly uh, the traffic becomes a guessing game sometimes now we move back a little bit that looks like Wayne Akers in the Ford and he's being challenged by Les Lindley now that's the 98 car of Hayner. Hayner, the man who had the problems a bit earlier, is challenging there at number 98. And he continues to roll along. He has now climbed to the number nine spot. He had the lead, took the black flag, was penalized, went to the pits, virtually the entire field stream passed before the officials let him back on course. And he has worked his way back to position number nine. What a spectacular run as we approach now. Well, we're better than a third of the way through this competition at Portland. Chasing Wayne Akers. We saw his team owner earlier say he's going to drive it till he drives the wheels off it. That's the way to go racing. So Wayne Akers, we saw him on a long, lazy oversteer slide through the infield section. But he's the next victim that Stu Hayner hopes to conquer. This is only the second time that Stu Hayner has driven in actual Trans Am competition. The first time was in 1989 at Long Beach. He won the 88 Corvette Challenge. And as we mentioned, he won on this racetrack in the Rose Cup. It's a long standing event of more than 30 years here just a, a week ago. It was a much shorter race than this one, but he's trying to get back into contention. But right now it's still Baldwin leading Fellows, Air, Grassfield, and Sharp. More coming up in a moment from Portland. <laughs> Some tire companies would love you to believe they're really involved in big time racing. But let me tell you something. There's only one tire company with the knowledge and commitment to make tires for our kind of racing. That company's name's Goodyear. And there ain't no one can tell you different. The only tires in IndyCar racing have Goodyear written all over them. You don't have to worry. 
Olympic oil stain has pure linseed oil. Since oil and water don't mix, it helps stop water damage. It's no wonder we'll stop the rain. Olympic stops the rain. All Olympic products are on sale now for a limited time at Sears. Oh, say can you see the great sports in July on ESPN. You'll see America's favorite pastime four nights a week. Booming drives, bursting in air at the British Open, U.S. Women's Open, and the U.S. Senior Open. American Olympic hopefuls taking their first steps toward Olympic glory at the U.S. Olympic Festival. Plus down-home NASCAR racing excitement in the land of the free and the home of great sports in July on ESPN. Back at Portland, we're watching Stu Hayner pick up another spot in his bid to get back up and challenge the leaders. He gets by Wayne Akers and takes over the number eight position. So the charge continues, and back in the pack, this fellow is really putting on a show on what I guess he would consider his home racetrack, even though he is a California driver. Let's check back into the pits with our colleague, Jan Bikas. Jim Jim Derhag has come in here, obviously, a lot earlier than you had planned. What happened? Oh, we had a little problem with the motor. It put us out for the day. You have some, I would say, the most competition miles of anybody in Trans Am, but yet it's still hard to take in it. Well, we only average about 0.8 DNS per year, so yeah, it's, it's pretty disheartening when it happens to us. We've got a what we feel is a real good preparation program and a good engine building program, and it just doesn't happen very often. Okay, thanks a lot. Gary? Jim Durhag, who is competing today in his 114th Trans Am event, 71 times he's finished in the top 10, but today will not be number 72. We're on board with Darren Brassfield. He continues to run fourth. It's been a nose-to-tail freight train up front. It's Baldwin still in the lead. He's being chased by Fellows and in traffic. It's Irv Hare still third, but his teammate is right there, and now Scott Sharp shows his nose. The Duracell number 33. A two-time winner this year, and we've got a terrific fight for third, fourth, and fifth. Let's go on board now. This is the view that Scott Sharp is getting from behind his steering wheel. And down here in the lower left portion of the screen, just under the graphic, you see the movement. That's the throttle linkage and the movement there, as you can see when he is on and off the gas. What a great picture of the throttle pedal here. You see? Watch the way he plays with the throttle. Look, on, off, on, off, on, off. Gets her straight. Nancy gives her maximum changes here. A great picture of just how the driver plays and uses uses that throttle pedal to balance the car. And look at how that body work out in front on the deck there begins to wiggle against the air currents. And look at that view in the traffic as he gets by a slower car. Oh, my word. You <laughs> see how fast they catch traffic and how fast they pass them. But, Gary, you mentioned you mentioned earlier on um, about the, uh, the uh, what's the throttle there, why we see that. See the way he changes gear on off the throttle? See it again right here. Picks top gear. Great picture here. You mentioned the uh, the hood of the car. Of course, they're so light. There might be a, a pass here. He's going to attempt to come down the inside. They're so light that they weave and bob around in the wind. Sharp at age 23, challenging Brassfield and Hare. They're a few years senior. They're driving Oldsmobile. Sharp's in the Camaro. He's had great success this year. Drops back a couple of car lengths, and again, we go on board to take a look from his vantage point as the competition continues to unfold here dramatically at Portland International Raceway. If you can't wait, you need the News Weekly of Motoring, Auto Week. If you can't wait for driving impressions, get Auto Week. Auto Week drives them all and tells you about them first. If you can't wait for car news, get Auto Week. Auto Week covers it all. The great old cars, the auto shows. Auto Week's columnists are controversial and fast. And if you can't wait for racing news, get the News Weekly of Motoring. Auto Week races to bring you the winningest coverage first. If you can't wait, get Auto Week. The News Weekly of Motoring, now. Call 1-800-828-4100 for a full year. 52 issues at the special TV price of $19.95. Just 38 cents an issue. Save $80 off the cover price. You've thought about it. Stop waiting. Do it now. Call 1-800-828-4100 for the News Weekly of Motoring. Whether I'm racing 200 miles an hour... 
driving 55. I don't accept compromises. You shouldn't either. Cars should be responsive, yet fuel efficient. Roomy, yet sleek. Not to mention affordable. Well, surprisingly, one car does all that and more. The new Cutlass Supreme. So take a look at any new Cutlass Supreme and see for yourself. Here's one car that does it all and does it right. New generation of old. You know, people say to me, Sonny, you're rich, handsome, and talented, and I say, oh, contraire, I'm not rich. <laughs> That's why I got the new coupon book available for many choice hotels like Econo Lodge, Roadway, and Friendship. It could save you over $1,000 at places like Pizza Hut, Alamo Rent-A-Car, and Theme Park. Call now, because they've got yours, babe. <laughs> Call 1-800-4-CHOICE to reserve your room and free coupon book. Supplies are limited. The Rocket Sports car's in trouble. Brassfield trying to make a move on the inside. Got up on the curbing. Almost made the pass. Managed to hang on. Didn't lose the position. But he almost lost control of the race car, Derek. That was another bold bid. Is he? Is that showing a sign of impatient? Or is that just a good competitive race driver at work? Oh, that's. I think it's a good competitive race driver at work. But also a good competitive and very aggressive driver that he was trying to pass. That was turn one. Brassfield came down the inside. But you see what happened. He ran out of road, had to climb all the way over the curve, got the car sideways, and is very lucky not to have spun off the racetrack. Irv Hare has been as cool as can be in trying to repulse the challenges of his teammates. But boy, when it is your teammate and you know what's at stake here, I would imagine it gets a little nerve-wracking if you're either on the front or the back end. Let's take another look. This is through the chicane. Now, Brassfield obviously gets the power on and runs up here a little bit faster. Come down the inside, inside under braking. Now, here comes across. Brassfield has nowhere to go. Wow. We saw him lock those rear wheels, get the car sideways, back on the racetrack, bobs and weaves, catches everything and says, boy, I need a breather before I try that again. What is it like for these drivers after competing just a week ago on the streets of Detroit where they're enclosed, encased virtually by concrete all the way around a two-and-a-half-mile circuit to be here on a natural terrain road course where it is a little more wide open without a doubt you can take more chances on a race car on a racetrack like this but a detroit or something within the walls you wouldn't dare do that let's go inside now this is where he accelerates a little bit faster comes down the inside but he's not far enough look bang over the curbs earth hair almost hits him gathers the whole thing up earth hair pulls out about three car lengths and darren brassfield takes a long long deep breath Darren Brasfield, 27 years of age, from Los Gatos, California. This particular car, we understand, spun on course, is now back under power and continues to circulate. Let's pick up a number if we can. Well, he slips Myers before we could fully identify the driver, and that was the 0-1 car of Steve Petty, who had a bit of an adventure a bit earlier with Steve Celine. Now we're back with our leaders cutting through the chicane at the end of the front straightaway. It's still Jack Baldwin, car number 28, and Ron Fellows continues to stalk him. He hasn't given him more than about three car lengths at any time this afternoon. Jack Baldwin is definitely in the pressure cooker here because uh, Ron Fellows is really pressurizing him all over the place. We saw him jump by, jump over the chicane earlier trying to make the pass. Jack Baldwin got him back again, but as soon as Baldwin gives Fellows any room, he knows he could be in trouble. Now let's go back and take a look at Steve Petty's adventure just a few moments ago from San Ramon, California, driving the 0-1 car. A GT1 SCCA champion of 1990 got it in there sideways, got up on the curb, hung on to it as he was trying to get around Bob Patch. Used up a lot of real estate and race course, but he's still going. We asked Scott Sharp how he viewed today's competition at Portland International Raceway. Well, theoretically, it should be a really good V8 track. That's what you would think. But then everyone's been saying that Dallas and Detroit are great V6 tracks, and you had a V8 on the pole of both of those. And here, where it's supposed to be a V8 track, you have V6s. So I think um, it's a nice track. It, it offers a lot more passing than some of the, the street circuits do. And uh, I'm going to need that today, coming from ninth. Oh. 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 Oh.
we're here in trouble. We have Deborah Gregg in car number two with bodywork dragging, and we also saw on the front straightaway one of the Rocket Sports cars has got problems. You see the smoke coming off of the Polk left front tire. He's the team owner. We don't know whether he made contact with Deborah Gregg or not, but Jen Pelosi's car is heavily damaged. He's running slowly, obviously on, on his way to the pits. Oh, he's, he's bobs and wheezes as he gets under braking. He'll have to go straight to the pits. Boy, what a tough break for Paul Gentilosi. Gentilosi, who was a third-place finisher at Detroit just a week ago, he owns the Rocket Sports team. They have been challenging from top five positions, but it looks like his afternoon's work may be complete. If they can get him back out on course, he's going to have lost a tremendous amount of ground. In the bodywork, we assume that that is a piece off Deborah Gregg's car that lies out alongside the racing surface near the guardrail. Back on board with Brassfield now. He continues his relentless pursuit of his teammate in the other two Rocket Sports cars. He's chasing Irv Hare. See what Brassfield does. He looks down the inside of each corner to see, is there a little bit of room that he can sneak his nose down through? Now, with what happened a couple of laps ago, he knows he has to be very, very definite and sure of his pass before he tries to make it. Here's J Paul Gentilosi, the team owner, still in trouble. That right rear tire is flat on that car. That's why he has most of the trouble. And he's headed into the pit area now, and you can see just uh, the extent of the problem there on that right rear side of the car, and his crew springs into action. Here's Deborah Gregg, and you can see the damaged bodywork on the left quarter panel and some of that material and the bodywork being ripped away on both sides of the car. This will be an air-conditioned car if Deborah is able to stay in the competition. Looks like she's ready to go. Disposable bodywork, that's the only way to keep yourself racing here. If it's damaged, yank it off and send her out again. Deborah Gregg, who is back in Trans Am competition after a year away, gets out just in front of the leaders, and here comes a challenge now for Ron Fellows. Fellows hanging on to the second spot in this parade. Hair challenge momentarily, and remember that Grassfield and Sharp right behind them. Oh, Five cars still very much in the hunt. I think I see a little bit of defensive driving there from Irv Hare. I don't think he was going to try and make the pass. Look at Fellows go down the inside of Deborah Gregg. I don't think he was going to try and make the pass from Fellows, but what he did is he moved over, which made the job of Darren Brassfield a lot more difficult if he was going to try and make the pass. Let's go to the pits again in Jan Bikas. Okay, we're here with Paul Genelosi. They're trying to repair the damage. What happened? I don't know. I was inside. It she never even looked. It turned right into me. No. Okay. He just took avoiding action and just did the best he could. Gary? Boy, you could sense the frustration in the voice of Paul Gentilosi and look at him now. The eyes tell the story as he shakes his head in disgust. A man who has had a terrific start to this season in the four early races encountering frustration. And he said that uh, she never saw him. And uh, there was contact, obviously. Gary, just look at this string of five cars we have here. This is as good a Trans Am race as we have seen for a long time. It's Baldwin who leads the procession. Still fellow second. Here, Brassfield and Sharp knocking on the door. Marilyn, in her own words. Everybody is always tugging at you. Julie Miller stars in a powerful play. Coming to center stage. Opening July 10th. <laughs> You'll laugh, I you'll cry. Brusco Bar presents the award-winning Julie Miller in Maryland, in her own words. Tickets are available now at the Center Stage box office at all Ticketmaster outlets. or charge by phone at 249-6400. Know what you can do with everything taking up extra space in your home or office? Stop it. Know what you can do with that antique car that's taking up extra space in your garage? <laughs> Stop it. Know what you can do with everything taking up extra space in your apartment? Stop it. Stuff it, a store all for only $5. Call 1-800-WE-STORE today. previous Trans Am race in Detroit, the top five qualifiers all had one thing in common. That is, they were driving Chevrolet Camaros designed by Bob Riley and built by Riley and Scott in Indianapolis. The body, however, is nothing new. This, in fact, comes out of the same mold that Bob Riley designed back in 1986. 
the changes take place in the suspension area. Down in here, you will see that they changed the suspension geometry to make the car turn better into the corners and, in fact, improve tire wear. They have also gone to a lighter caliper, brake caliper here, to save some weight up front. It just goes to show that sometimes a minor change on a race car can make a major difference on the racetrack. Gary Gerald and Derek Daly on the front straightaway at Portland International Raceway, and Scott Sharp has moved up. He has caught Darren Brasfield. He has muscled his way now into the fourth position as he has slowly worked his way forward to challenge. It is still on top. Baldwin, the leader. Fellows is second. Irv Hare is third. But now the 33 car of Scott Sharp has taken over fourth, and Darren Brasfield wants to get it back. A classic racing pass by Scott Sharp goes down the inside, takes the piece of road in the line that Brasfield wanted. Brasfield had no recourse, couldn't come back. Sharp ducks inside, takes the position, and now he heads out after her hair. Well, I tell you, this kid, and I call him a kid because he's only 23, he was the youngest ever to compete in Trans Am competition, but what a job, and he shows so much poise, and now he back, makes a pass through traffic, continues to stalk here in the fourth spot. Let's go down to the pits of Jan Bikas. We're with Buzz McCall, who's the team owner for Jack Baldwin and Scott Sharp. You got two cars running right up front. Uh, we got our hands full right now, for sure. Uh, Jack had a good start. Uh, Stu got a little bad luck on uh, a little trickery there to start, I think. But uh, they're running a fast pace. All the first five are right close together, so we got our fingers crossed. Okay, we wish you good luck. It's kind of like an American racing uh, sandwich you got out going there. Well, we sure do. Uh, the Chevy uh, Camaros are uh, right now the bread between that meat of the Oldsmobile. So let's uh, we want to put it to bed and get Jack a win. Scott had a great win last week in Detroit. Um, love to see him cross the finish line together. That can't happen, but we got our fingers crossed for both of them. Scott Sharp once again making a challenge, and he's picked off another one of the Oldsmobiles as he gets by Irv Hare, and now has taken over third place. Fellows and Baldwin still run right in front of him, but Scott Sharp is really making a patented and a very poised move from back in the pack, now in the top three. After 30 laps, Jack Baldwin, the leader, he has led all but two of those 30 laps. We haven't had a caution flag, and the average speed is on record pace. The record here in some 15 years at Portland is just under 96 and a half miles per hour, so it has been a fast race thus far, and much of the attention now focused on Scott Sharp chasing number four, Ron Fellows, who is in second place. Baldwin, still your leader. You see him in the green and white Camaro, now working his way toward the tight ninth turn, and then they'll be back through the gears on the long front straightaway, leading to that interesting and intriguing little chicane where we've seen so many close calls. In fact, Fellows, earlier in the competition, jumped over the curves, found himself the recipient of a black flag, which they then rescinded, and he has been able to hang on to second place as we go down through the uh, field of drivers in this competition. A very entertaining event at Portland International Raceway. Lap traffic, that's Glenn Fox in one of the ex-Roush cars being passed by Irv Hare and now by Darren Brasfield. We're back inside Brasfield's car. But earlier, people thought Portland would be a V8 racetrack. Qualifying was not so. These two cars here, V6 powered cars, were on the front row, or, or um, one of the teammates was. But in the race, we see the V8s are coming to the fore. The first three positions, all V8 engines board with Darren Brasfield. You get a good look at how he works with that shift lever to his right. You can see the feet in action on board on this nine turn, 1.9 mile course at Portland International Raceway. Just see how fast he has to grab that gear shift to change, jump right change down on the brakes, makes a quick gear change. But look at the shoulder support he has. He goes inside one of the cars. Look at the shoulder support he has when the car goes left and right around these corners. It supports his body inside that car. Jack Baldwin, 43-year-old driver from Marietta, Georgia. Last year's Rookie of the Year in Trans Am, but no rookie to road racing. 21 IMSA career wins. Continues to set the pace at Portland. He has led all but two laps, but he's had his hands full. Fellows continues to challenge. Sharp is right there. Karen Brasfield round out the top five. Where do you want to be next year? 
You know, I, I don't plan to be a partner in this firm forever. In fact, I've been doing something on the side that could be very rewarding. I have an offer to work full time with some kids. Pays 11,000 a year. Now, how can we restructure my portfolio so I can tell them yes? You can get there from here with Shearson Lehman Brothers. When you consider everything the mountains have to offer, it's not surprising why anyone would want to work up here. Come to think of it, it's not surprising why they'd want to hang around after work either. Angeles Dodgers are leading the National League West. The bionic arm of Oral Hershiser is back to its old dominating self. The Dodgers face the Braves live at 8 Eastern on ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Brassfield, who was carrying our onboard camera, looping it around, but I don't think he lost the position. Nobody has been able to get by. Pickett was running sixth. He'll try to close up now on Darren Brassfield, but Brassfield has lost sight momentarily of the four men he was stalking in front of him. And now you can see Stu Hayner at number 98, moving up to gain a position. He now runs six as he gets by Greg Pickett. And remember, he's come all the way from the back after an early black flag incident. Number 98, Hayner, is currently six. Pickett is now shuttled back one spot to seven. Brassfield had his hands full, but now look at the battle. And for the first time, Fellows has poked his nose into the lead in the chicane. He got by on the inside of Jack Baldwin, who had been masterful throughout the race. And Sharp continues to run third, but season points leader Ron Fellows, who has only one Trans Am win to his credit in his career, now in sight of a victory at Portland. We've got somebody else off course now. Drama. This is Jerry Clinton, number 14, losing it and getting it out into the grass. And suddenly in these final laps, everything breaking loose, Derek Daly. My word, we watched that five-car train just follow each other around for so long, but now in the closing stages, all hell breaks lose all the action stars everybody trying to get a position on the the, the finest piece of, piece of opportune overtaking was obviously Stu Hayner when he passed Greg Pickett. Well Clinton is back on track but the new leader is Ron Fellows in car number four and now Baldwin will try to do what he can to see if he can wrestle the lead that he has enjoyed through so much of the afternoon back. Scott Sharp in car number 33, passing traffic, closing up now, trying to challenge from the third position. And look at Baldwin inside, and look at the back ends twitch as they go through the chicane. That's where the pass for the lead was made by Fellows a lap ago. Absolutely right on the limit as we see uh, Steve Salee's car get some attention in the pit lane. His day has obviously done too much smoke, but we saw Jack Baldwin right on the limit of the braking of that Chevrolet trying to close up on this man who's now the leader. Ron Fellows in the Rav Ford. Let's go back and take a look now from an onboard camera at the spin. This is Darren Brassfield's car number five. He's in fifth position. This is exiting turn three. Now he's hard on the brakes. This is turn five. Gets inside. Oh, this is what happened to him earlier on. Tried to get inside his teammate. Earth Hair loses control this time, but didn't lose a position. Crew members for Ron Fellows anxiously biding time in the pitch. You can feel the tension it shows on the face. Can Fellows hang on for his second career Trans Am win? Jumping on the backside, Fellows in trouble, and Scott Sharp slides by. It was in traffic. They were making a move, and Fellows fighting it to get back on course. But now we have a new leader. It appears to be Scott Sharp who jumped on top. Fellows went around one more time, but in fact, it may have been Irv Hare who pushed his nose through. The crew will be about to find out as they'll come by the pit area one more time. And let's check up here and see who will have the lead of this race. Fellows is back on course. First, it was Fellows getting by Baldwin. Then disappointment for Baldwin. Now disappointment for Fellows. Time running out at Portland. 
So now Irv Hare is in the lead. We saw the action. We will go back and have another look. Now watch what happens. Jack Baldwin tries to come down the inside. Fellows will slow the traffic. But look, Baldwin doesn't make it, but he hits the back right there. Sends Fellows into a spin. Baldwin is slowed because he can't go ahead and go around him. Scott Sharp and Irv Hare go by. Irv Hare is in the lead. What an action-packed event. Boy, you talk about opportunistic driving. Certainly, Irv Hare was in the right spot. Listen now, on the throttle, Scott Sharp from the cockpit, chasing that car in front of him. Irv Hare leading this race for the very first time after the incident involving Baldwin, who is challenging our leader, Rod Fellows. A lap and a half remaining now for Irv Hare, who won just a few weeks ago on the streets or on the temporary circuit of Dallas. Now trying to do it here on the road course in Portland. And the V6 engine of the Oldsmobile has been in second place and behind chasing those V8s all afternoon. Now they're in the lead on the V8 of Scott Sharp, and he's about 10 car lengths behind. Has to chase down the V6, but he doesn't have much time to do it. He makes the turn, turn number nine, the right-hander onto the front straightaway, and as he passes the start-finish line this time by, he'll have 1.922 miles to go, and you see just how much breathing room he has over Scott Sharp. Sharp, a two-time winner this year, trying to mount a last lap challenge. And that was Scott Sharp favorite overtaking position all afternoon not nearly close enough to make an attempt on Irv Hare but he does climb up all over the curve and Jack Baldwin is in the pits poor Jack Baldwin he had led so much of this race the crew having difficulty getting him restarted he lays down a patch of rubber and frustration and you can see some damage to the front of the car there on the left side Derek after that altercation with Fellows but it looks like even without that damage if the incident never happened and Baldwin was leading he still couldn't have won this race because he didn't have enough fuel in the car. This is Paul Genelosi losing a lap as Hare goes by, his teammate. Hare closing in now, once again up over the curves. He's using up the real tight line, trying to protect the advantage, taking absolutely no chances, even though there's now a slower car between him and the Challenger Sharp. His crew urging him on, onto the front straightaway. The checkered flag now in sight, and no chance for Sharp to get the victory. Instead, the checkers to Hare. Sharp will have to settle for second place. And look, Stu Hayner has managed to get the number three spot after after that long drive from deep in the pack of the early black flag, Darren Brasfield will finish fourth. Very Stu impressive Hayner. run by Stu Hayner to come back from that earlier black flag incident. What a motion, motivational tool for a driver when you get pulled in like that, and he really came on, put on a superb show. But the man of the moment, this man, Herb Hare, in the Oldsmobile number six. Brett Bodine, one tough driver, talks about Quaker State, one tough motor oil. At North Wilkesboro, that Carolina asphalt was hot enough to fry our King Racing Buick. Our engine was running hot, 240 degrees, and I had to keep pushing it over 8,000 RPM. Now that's when you start worrying about your oil's viscosity breaking down. But when the going got tough, the same Quaker State you can buy right off the shelf was tough enough to get me to the finish line first. Quaker State is one tough motor oil. Last year, every single race in the World Sports Car Championship was won on Goodyear Eco Tires, including eight of the nine championship races won by Mercedes-Benz. The World Championship winning Mercedes-Benz team uses Goodyear Eco Radials exclusively, and their winning performance is just one of the reasons we say the best tires in the world have Goodyear written all over them. You're watching ESPN, the Total Sports Network. So after a victory on the temporary circuit a few weeks back in Dallas, Irv Hare gets his second win of the year. Sharp is second. Stu Hayner, what a great job from deep in the pack after the black flag to finish third. This SCCA Liquid Side Trans Am Tour event at Portland has been brought to you on Speed World by Quaker State. The Big Q is one tough motor oil. 
had by Goodyear, maker of the world's most successful tires, the Goodyear Eagles. Let's go to Jan Bikas in victory lane with a victorious Irv Hare. Thank you. Congratulations, Irv Hare. It's your second victory of the season. What a wild race. Oh, thank you. You know, we got a little bit lucky there at the end. Uh, those VH pretty well had us covered. We could run lap times with them, but, uh, you know, we couldn't pass anybody, and they had us beat down a straightaway. And even if we got by them, they could pass us back on the straightaway. So I was just kind of biding my time, hoping their tires would get soft. And the old Olivetti Neo Life Oldsmobile held in there, you know, and she stayed healthy, and we got lucky when they started taking one another out down there, and we just kind of snuck by. So, you know, it was a good race. Uh, we had to run hard all the way. There wasn't an easy lap in the race. Congratulations. Thank you. Gary? Career Trans Am win number seven for Irv Hare. Scott Sharp settles for second, but he takes the season points lead. Brassfield, the number four spot. Fellows, who had the adventure with Baldwin, is sixth. Baldwin ends up eighth. Quite a show, Derek Daly. Just a great Trans Am event, and the most pleasing thing I saw was the Stu Hayner comes along with a star performance. Record average speed of better than 97 miles per hour as we congratulate Irv Hare. For Derek Daly and Jan Bikas, I'm Gary Gerald. So long from Portland.